All right, we are live. Dr. Cochran, good morning. Good <laughs> Go morning. ahead and uh, good morning. Go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Tell tell me a little bit about your background, and uh, um, and then we're going to dive into some um, some of the latest and greatest and 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 uh, um, some new alternative techniques and and what you're doing and stuff there too. But um, jump in. Yeah. So um, my background: I'm a naturopathic medical doctor. Uh, I did an undergrad in chemistry at the University of Washington, and then I went up to uh, Bastyr University and put in my another four years after undergrad for my naturopathic medical degree. I um, have some background in spending about six, seven months in the emergency medicine and then doing a fellowship in integrative oncology uh, with Bastyr at that time. And... Um, I guess one of my passions other than clinical medicine is teaching. I mean, I did that as an undergrad and I've done that in, in some of the nursing schools locally and I've done it at the school. And then I currently do that with several different groups uh, from IV nutrition to ozone to orthopedic stuff to you name it. Uh, I've pretty much been around the circuit. Uh, I know we were talking earlier and sometimes it's multiple weekends, which is always fun because you get to meet different people and kind of see what, what things they're up to as well. Yeah. I see what everybody's bringing to the table. Now I, just for our audience, I mean, even as, uh, um, so I, a little bit about, uh, what I'm trying to accomplish is bring in legends, lessons from legends and natural medicine, natural healthcare in general. And uh, that's why you're here. That's, it's awesome. Uh, but you know, as, um, even as a physician that maybe listen to this or general public, I mean, what is a natural medical doctor? I mean, I, you know, most might not even know what that is. Naturopathic medical medical doctor kind of sounds like an oxymoron in a, in a way, but, <laughs> but there's more and more, um, uh, more and more doctors that I talk to that are leaving mainstream medicine and, and going this direction more of the natural flair. Cause they're tired of, uh, kind of the framework that, uh, they have to, to work in there. So, um, up, uh, update us on that if you don't mind. Yeah, it, it, it's actually very interesting. You know, I didn't know anything about it in undergrad and I was, chemistry and the main reason I went this way, I was looking at pharmacy or, or actually conventional medical school. And the big thing that happened is I met a person who was a pharmacist who then became an naturopathic medical doc and said, Hey, you got to look at going this way because you get to use all your biochemistry and physiology. Yes. And I think the, one of the biggest things we've forgotten in medicine is we focus so much on pathology and identifying the name of the disease that we forget physiology and we can't get a person well unless we understand physiology so physiology and biochemistry have always been a strong suit for me and it felt like a good fit because we emphasize heavily that inside and out throughout school and so i think when you look at a naturopathic medical doctor some people will see see us as oh wow well, there's there's some of these people you know old school that were like hippie-ish and and then there's others that are a little more maybe streamlined. And I'd say it's like any profession, you get a different breed depending on your specialty. But the biggest thing I like that kind of separates us out is we have a massive toolbox and we can evaluate and provide different supports at different stages of the journey before we need to go to something more aggressive like a medication or surgery. And I, I find that very limited and that's one of the reasons I didn't want to go that way is there's got to be other ways of getting people well and keeping them well than just two options. Um, and I'd say the interesting part of it, it, it's nothing, it's not really new. It's kind of how history we circle back around, you know, back yes. in the day we had medical doctors that were very natural focused. And then we had this other group that was more surgical and, and uh, drug focused and we kind of split ways and what ended up happening is the naturopathic doctorate degree kind of was an evolution of those medical doctors that didn't want to continue to practice surgery and drugs yeah which is incredible um and uh, I was doing some research. We uh, we did a presentation for sports nutrition, and uh, I was coming back full circle. And um, um, there was uh, the Kellogg dynasty 
Um, so the brother to Dr. Kellogg, um, was, um, the one that started a lot of the serials and things like that too. But, um, um, but to go back and, and read on how they were talking about clean living, um, and coming back to, um, and this was like, um, you know, gosh, he was born in the 18, 1800s. So early 1900s, um, the, the clean living movement that they were right. trying to start with nutrition and movement and clean cleanliness of, of mind. And then I got to mention just because, um, and anybody that hasn't listened to some of the previous podcasts, Dr. Schellenberger, Dr. Levy, um, they are all saying the same thing. Dr. Levy had a, at his, um, uh, a board certified cardiologist and learned from um, a, a dentist about IV nutrition. <laughs> so his story was absolutely incredible. Just going down, he was seeing this um, 84 year old woman, a woman that came in for um, some tooth issues, but he was starting to treat her for um, uh, systemically with IV nutrition and watched her over a period of weeks get just incredibly better. And uh, that started his journey into understanding vitamin C and writing the book. Um, Dr. Schallenberger, 50 years now in medicine, um, just met with him too. Um, and uh, he was talking about how, how he went to um, his mentor and was like, and, and literally sat in the likes of Linus Pauling in the, in the, um, in the, in the library um, down in San Francisco, but, <laughs> and told that story, you got to listen to that. It's super cool. Um, but he said the same thing. He goes, you know, I went to my mentor and said, look, I'm not getting people well. And uh, the, the response is like, Frank, we don't get people well. We just, and that was the, under the veil of medicine, we just kind of helped them with their symptoms and that wasn't okay for him. Um, so, um, fast forward, if you will, you don't have to fast forward. You can just walk through. Um, and so you got involved in that and, and, and your start and understanding the natural flair and had a passion for that. And I love the fact that you bring that chemistry and biochemistry because it's so important. And I always, I've always said, I was like, gosh, I always, as a, as a chiropractor, um, we go through school and yeah. have, um, we always said in class, we're sitting there, we're like, God, you know, we're, we're sitting here learning and, and, and 99% of our schooling was for that 1% that we'd probably never see <laughs> for, for diagnostics, radiology, all the pathologies, all the oncologies, you know, that we have to identify. Um, and it was always frustrating point. Um, but there's such a healthy relationship to be able to have the power of a prescription pad because they're sometimes needed, but understanding the chemistry and biochemistry that, that, that you do and moving that into a natural regime to help people. So walk me through that journey. Yeah, I mean, back to the 1800s, one of the guys that we had to read a book, and I think it's a great one everybody should read, is uh, Nature's Law by Lindlar. Um, and basically nice. it says exactly what you're saying. If you can't, if you're not practicing or you're or you're basically in your health, if you're not practicing or you're abusing nature's law, which is water, getting outside, moving your body, getting electrons, getting oxygen, if you're not doing that, you can't get well. Because again, you don't understand how physiology works, the demands of what is necessary for you to get well. And so, you know, a few of my mentors also the same thing. It was literally like, okay, get rid of the pathology don't focus on the disease because you're just going to throw things at it and treat the symptoms and we do that i think in conventional medicine but i also see that a lot now in like functional medicine people gravitating towards that way where they don't totally understand the dynamics and they send the patient out with in my opinion more supplements than they really need because they yes. don't understand supporting physiology Instead, what they're doing is trying to bury each symptom. So there, there's no difference there. And I think that's the, the real art, like you said, of the, the elders is learning how do I improve this physiology so then the person's pathology just disappears. Goes away. Um, one of the most powerful things I've, I've heard more recently, and I've known about it for a long time, but I think it's a really one, really, really good one to emphasize is the body's lymphatics. We don't mm -hmm. do a lot with that. And if you ever look in specialty medicine, it's the one specialty that does not exist is a lymphatic specialist. Why? We don't have a drug. We don't have a procedure that can do anything like that. So how do we get our lymph to move? It's, it's literally getting your body moving every day is the number one thing that we do. And we forget a lot of these systems and then we get kind of narrow minded into this box 
and we say, oh, let's just kill the bug or let's just uh, treat this one little thing with this nutrient. And, and we forget the context of everything is together and it's, it's, you have to be focused on the terrain. Um, the analogy I have is you can't, if you have a dirty fish tank, you can't be throwing stuff at it. Hope that fish is going to get well. Right. So yes, that's, that's been my journey is finding those tools that you can really use on top of addressing the terrain to move physiology in a positive direction. Ah, that's incredible. Um, and it's so true. I mean, uh, even as natural, when I talk to natural doctors, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the digestive system, which no doubt is a, is an important system. <laughs> However, we, we often neglect, uh, so many different systems. Um, I learned from, um, Dr. West, um, he's a chiropractor, naturopath, and uh, not too far from us in Pocatello. And um, um, he um, uh, opened my eyes to hydrogen peroxide and, uh, and a hydrogen peroxide IV that he was doing um, that we brought in to be able to flush the lymphatic system and, and the mechanism the biochemistry behind that. But he was also talking about how it's such a necessary part of cancer because cancer cells can hide in the lymphatic system, which we know, right? When somebody goes in, uh, you know, uh, God forbid they have a breast uh, carcinoma of some sort. I mean, it's, they're going to look at the lymph glands, right? Cause that's, <laughs> they may even take some of them out, which is, you know, a, a different direction. But, um, uh, um, so I, you know, it, again, I go back to some of these doctors that I'm interviewing and it's like, Levy is like, get the, get the cell charged with vitamin C and everything settles out. Uh, Schallenberg's oxygen, get the body in an oxygen, maximum oxygen state. And it's exactly what you're talking about, um, to, to rid disease and, 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 uh, um, help the body optimize and thrive. Um, so uh, tell me, tell me what you're doing then, um, and uh, understanding, you know, the lymphatics, what do you know? You do IV nutrition, you're doing, um, all sorts of different angles on, on oxygen. So just talk through some of those things. What got you on that direction? Now you're teaching on it as well. And I want you to kind of expand on that, what you um, it's okay to kind of fly your flag, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So the, I mean, the things that I, 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 my mentors and what I use is, okay, I need electrons in the body. How do I do that? Yeah. Well, I can Love use it. devices to help charge the cells. I can get people grounding. And then the other thing is oxygen. How do I do that? Well, I can move the body, but sometimes people's disease state is too far along. So then we have options. And I think ozone is, is an amazing option because you get oxygen to the cells. You also improve oxygen utilization or how you deliver oxygen. So it's not just, I'm just going to exercise and get oxygen. You're doing so much more. And uh, ozone, I think when you're looking at tools, I look at tools that can hit multiple different areas are, are amazing. If they hit one area, it's it's very limited. And ozone has so many things it does with immune modulation, moving the lymph, oxygenating the cells. And that's one of the tools that gravitated me. Um, initially, I thought it was kind of like, no, nah, this can't do that. It's too good to be true. There's no research. You know how it is. And then it's too simple. <laughs> I, I dug into it. It's too simple, right? And And so I dug into the literature. And I saw, holy cow, there's a lot of stuff on this. And, you know, one of the few people that actually introduced me to ozone was Jason West and another guy called Dennis Harper, those two guys. And I dove into it. And I, I'm more of the detailed focus guys. I think these guys are more macro thinkers. So I want to know exactly how it's working, what are the side effects, how to dose it. And it, a lot of that detail wasn't being taught at the time. So yeah. I started doing, I had an association just ask me, Hey, you've done ozone for a while. Can you give us a presentation? And I'm like, sure, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump on there. Um, I, I've done some in my practice. I've learned a lot of details. I've learned the do's and don'ts of it. And so I taught that class and then it grew to other physicians asking to create like a hands-on in person type of course, because they liked that level of detail and understanding of why did this happen in my person, not just do this. Yes. And it flourished into uh, ozone trainings, um, being invited to Schallenberger's courses to lecture now twice at the AAOT, lecture Frontiers of Ozone, lecture at Masters of Ozone twice. Um, and then be at like the Academy of Environmental Medicine. So many different dynamics now of, 
of ozone. And more recently, we've also launched into another way of delivering ozone and filtering called EBU. So that, that's kind of the evolution of what happened with ozone. Now, before all this, in school, I was doing IV nutrition with one of my colleagues who was teaching with a group called IV Nutritional Therapy, um, International IV Nutritional Therapy for Physicians. And um, I got really interested in that, started teaching with them, and I've been doing that for years. And they were kind of like the bread and butter original group that was teaching. I know um, Jason and quite a few of these other people took some of the initial classes. And this is before, you know, IV was popular. This is when they were back literally doing it in their homes, little IV nutritional bags and tweaking it. Mm -hmm. And we've... We blew that up and now look at it these days. Everybody's doing it. I mean, it's popping up all over the place. It is, yeah. And the key thing with it is it was such a powerful tool to be able to get a person well because you could kind of cheat the system, bypass the gut, and, and get them moving within a matter of weeks to months versus taking years if you were moving, depending on how sick that person was. And so I think, you know, going into that, really seeing the change that it had in, in improving people's health was huge from a nutritional standpoint. And then you add the oxygen component to that as well. You have a pretty strong formula, treatment formula going on, at least the tools that you're utilizing. They just need to fill in the gaps with the other things. So that, that's kind of my journey of how those two things have come together and how I've been known as you know, one of the experts in ozone and also nutritional therapies. Ah, uh, that's phenomenal. That is phenomenal. What, um, yeah, being a science guy, um, I want to, I want to ask you a couple questions on that, but, uh, you know, looking at the data and I'm similar that way. I mean, um, I've, I've learned to be kind of some of the big picture. Cause, um, if you go too detailed with patients, they're like, ah, what are you talking about? I'm like, here, here's bottom line. This, <laughs> yeah, here's what it's doing. But I love having that data. What are, what are some of the objective tools that you guys use to say, Hey, look, maybe, um, maybe this person is in a, um, oxygen deficient state. Um, although simply, I mean, everybody, everybody could benefit from ozone, but, um, where do you see some of, some of the greatest tools right now? So like speaking to some of the doctors out there that may not be familiar with these things, what are you using and, and, and uh, um, the evolution into Ibu and some of these other things too? Yeah. So I know there's a lot of great tools out there. My, my goal is to try to figure out, you know, what is affordable for the clinic and for the patient, right? You bet. So I'm a simple tool just to give you an example is, common old school LDH, lactate dehydrogenase. It's a cheap test and I can get a lot of information on that. So if it basically tells you how you're utilizing glucose and oxygen. And if, if that test is high and high for me is anything above 175, we got a problem. The terrain is not focused, not working well. You're either consuming way too many carbohydrates, way too much sugar, or you're not getting oxygen to your cells efficiently. You're, you're basically what's called anaerobic respiration. You're fermenting. Yeah. And we know <laughs> fermentation is a bad thing. Your yeah. body's basically a beer keg or, or wine. Yeah, that's terrible for disease states. So that, that's Turn an easy test that I use in my practice. <laughs> yeah, you're turning to compost. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, another one I use is in my practice is I actually use live blood analysis. Uh, I think it's a fantastic tool to show people what's going on in their terrain. Like any tool, it could be abused. I've seen people diagnose off of it. And I think it's best sure. to be used as, hey, this is what's going on in your system right now. We have problems with the way your blood is flowing, the way things are in there. And I think it's a really powerful tool to show the person without getting into the nitty gritty details of biochemistry, but Hey, this is what's going on live stream right now in your body. Um, so I, I use that one as an evaluation tool. Uh, a few others I like is uh, in body, body impedance tells me a lot about yep. the cell health and the dynamics of fluid compartments as we want to make sure most of the fluids inside our cells, not outside. Intercellular. Mm -hmm. And then I, 
I also love um, something called CRT, or it's basically a local regional th thermography device. And it shows you about lymphatic congestion or inflammation in tissues. Um, and a lot of these things, you use them, you get a pretty good idea where the problem is, even before you have to do, you know, images like CTs and MRIs, and, and you'll start to get an idea years before it becomes a serious pathology. Uh, so those are some of the things I use to evaluate. Of course, there's a, millions of different labs out there. Sure. Um, but those are some of my power player evaluation things. No, I love it. And, um, you know, again, it, it, to any doctor that's being exposed for the first time, I, I just, you know, bring things together. And, and Schallenberger said it, said it well. He had a lot of sick people that showed up well on a typical blood lab, which we, we know to be true. And, mm -hmm. and uh, um, I, you know, we've talked round and round with different uh, physicians and even people that it's like, I know something's wrong with me, but it's not showing up on my blood work. <laughs> and, uh, the live blood analysis, for those of you who have not experienced it or not ever been exposed to it, there's a ton of science to it, um, and um, it is a powerful tool to show patients, too, because they can see. I ended up uh, doing, like, I think we have two 50-inch screens. Here's a normal. Here's where you're at. Just to be able to show people um, how, like exactly what you said. So the red blood cells and, and I, I stole this from Dr. West. I love it. He's like, this is how your cells are taking in the groceries and taking out the trash. And if those cells look horrible, they're all clumped together. They're just not doing these things. What do you think's happening? Well, we're not getting nutrients and oxygen, um, to vital tissues and organs. And then we're not detoxifying. We're not taking out the trash. So um, that's awesome. I want to, I want to dive into a couple of those other tests, LDH uh, in a little bit, but, um, um, what it, it, it's, it's kind of crazy. You mentioned this in, um, kind of bring this full circle, how, how you got into IV nutrition. I remember in school, I got exposed to Russell Blaylock's book and he would not, he would not jump on a podcast with me. He said, Todd, Todd, I'm old. He's like, I don't look good on camera, but what questions do you have? So I, I, I put a bunch of questions out there. He answered, I'll share them with you. You'd love to read through his stuff, but um, uh, much of it is, you know, in books and things like that. But one of the things that, uh, he was doing, and this turned me on to, and his, um, his book, Excitotoxins, got to be almost 30 years old. Um, but he got, he got fired from his hospital. Uh, I, I believe it was in, in the South for actually getting people stroke victims. So he's a neuro board certified neurosurgeon. Um, and he got fired yeah. for do, doing a lot of these things because he was getting people out of the hospital beds and the hospital bed or the hospitals were saying, Hey, we're making money off this. You're getting people out of these scenarios. So, um, anyways, I know you're interested in some of the neurology in your, your, you know, um, you're working with, with that as well. Tell, I, you know, tell me about that. Yeah, it's interesting. You actually say, you know, you get people well and you get booted out. One of my other teachers from New Zealand, uh, where we use, uh, what's called perineural injection therapy. Oof. And I, I actually got trained at it same time Jason West was, but I took it a little further and flew down to New Zealand and trained with him. He was doing so well getting people out of pain that the basically the board told him, well, you got two options, either you need to go back for re-education or you can retire early. So <laughs> I see that very commonly. You do a good job in medicine. You're controversial. We got to get rid of you. Um, <laughs> so, but from back to your kind of neuro perspective, other than pain management, uh, I've been working with a guy out of sh just outside Chicago. They're called the Neuroscience Center of Chicago, and it's heavily focused in neuropsychiatric illness. Yes. And he, he asked me to come on board because he's, you know, MD, knows his meds, knows hyperbaric well, ketamine, TMS, which is a basically a magnetical uh, stimulation unit. And he said, hey, we, we need to know more about internal medicine and nutrition, how that affects our patients. And <laughs> the type of patients we're getting are like, you're talking bipolar, tick-borne illness, schizophrenia, really complicated cases. And the commonality of everyone, depression, bipolar, any of these things, if you run their tests, you will find all of them are deficient in nutrients because they're eating terrible foods, right? The standard American diet. Yes. And they usually have some degree of infections present. And, and the, the global picture of this is 
you'll find they have neuroinflammation. It's like, well, no, duh, you have, you're depressed or anxious or you're having panic attacks. And the, the key thing that was cool is there's, there's two tests we use in that clinic just to kind of show people this is real. Uh, one is called a Cunningham profile. It's a blood antibody test. It looks for autoimmune disease in the brain. And wow. so if you have these high antibodies, it says, hey, your body's actively attacking the neurons in your brain. And then there's another one called a spec scan. It's an expensive test. Unfortunately, you get a little bit of yeah. radiation from it. So it's not for everyone, but it can show you how well blood is moving through different areas of the brain. And then you can get a report and understand why they're having those symptoms. A uh, big example, I have a kid in my clinical practice. He came in visual issues, panic disorders, his MRI was fine, neurology, you know, the, the story. We did a spec scan on him and he had a hole about the size of a golf ball in his occipital lobe, which is back here. And it, it basically controls your vision. vision and he scenario. was having visual issues and nobody could figure it out. And it was because he wasn't getting perfusion in there. And the reason he wasn't getting perfusion is because he had so much inflammation from mold exposure and nutrient deficiencies and not moving his body and being stuck in, you know, video game mode all the time and yep. overstimulated there. And so that's kind of the cases that we've seen. It's like these, these really, these cases you would expect to be inpatient or put on these heavy doses of medication to just sedate them. And nobody's looking at why they're just trying to kind of calm down the fire. Yes. But if you dig with these tools, you, you can clearly see this pattern. It's like, okay, they got infections. They got nutrient issues. They got gut issues. Like you said, it's, it's uncommon to find somebody that doesn't have gut issues. That's chronically ill. Yes. Um, they're toxic. Those are all commonalities that you have to address. And it's no different than the other disease processes. And I think it's interesting. We keep seeing this, you know, conventional medicine, you'll see a Medscape drop or something every now and then it's like, yeah, we've been addressing that for the last five or 10 years. Where have you been? Um, just <laughs> looking at the commonalities of, yeah, we got to have these things working if you want the disease process to resolve. <laughs> big time, big time. Yeah. I, um, so, um, interesting, uh, kind of sidestep, but, um, bringing some things together. So, um, Don Harrison, who created the model, um, for, um, basically he was a chiropractor and realized that there was no normal spinal model, looked at the literature and there was like, yeah, we knew scoliosis was bad. Um, but, um, uh, uh, there was like, there was no established numerical normal to this. So he goes down and gets a degree in mechanical engineering um, to be able to, to, you know, look at stresses and strains and how that works in the body. And it made some sense. And, and, but in order to model this thing goes on and gets a PhD in finite math, mathematical modeling, just absolutely phenomenal brain. And uh, his son, I ended up joining in practice and um, I is still out there, phenomenal brain um, as how they're working. But one of the models that we came back to was a, a normal cervical curve and now they're starting to do pre and post, um, pre and post uh, uh, MRIs and showing the absolute perfusion yeah. to the brain in extension where there's a mechanical model to this. But then also you're talking about a biochemical model. Um, I, I, it excites me because there's so many things that you can start bringing together. Alf Bragg, a Swedish neurosurgeon, like in the 1960s, I, um, I sought out and got one of his books. They've, they've been taken off, off, but um, he would show inflection versus extension of the perfusion of the blood flow to the brain too, so neurologically. But I love to hear you guys treating or working and seeing these aspects and trying to normalize some of that 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 flow. And then I can't help but not mention the uh, article that Dr. West shared with me at a British medical journal said that uh, um, um, low grade chronic infections like bacterial and even um, viral infections um, causing neural behavioral neurodegenerative changes. And now we have things like Panda yep. that are starting to pop up and, and all these types of things. And, and as complex as we get, we can still bring it back down to like you know what you're talking about. We just you got to serve the body at its basic needs, um, and and kind of go from there. Uh, yeah, it's so cool. I get excited about this stuff. I start geeking out on it. Like you said, it's usually you got all these bugs in there and all this trash, and it it eventually creates the 
the immune system freaks out and you get autoimmune disease, right? And that's, yes. so how do I get that better? Everybody's like, well, I'll just throw an immune suppressant at it. That's conventional medicine's perspective. Yes. I'm like, no, you, you got to pull the onion away, get that bacteria out, get the toxicity out. And like you're talking about the spinal flexion, I think another thing I learned is uh, neural therapy is a great tool. Um, I learned mine from Jeff Harris, who basically is trained with Klinghart and Jeff Harris is one of the best Klinghart even said he's probably the best neurotherapist out there. And wow. one of the things I learned from them is like you were talking about the brain and the spinal fusion is not just blood flow, but lymphatic flow, everything yes. from the brain has to go through the tonsils. And so we get this congestion, like you said, oh, pans, pandas, oh, it's all in the tonsils and strep and all this. It's all connected in order to get best perfusion of waste in and out of tissues. It's huge. And I, um, I, I, this may have been around for a while, but, um, uh, uh, I, I have fun in marketing and I, I, I will constantly look at trends and stuff, but I was cruising through Instagram on, on a couple of components came across, across this Q collar and I was like, and reducing, um, concussions. And they had data. So I'm always like, show me the data first. I'm going to see the data. And then I'm like, so I'll dive in. And I'm like, you got data. This is good. So let me start reading on this. But it's exactly this collar comes around the neck and works on the jugular and opening up the jugular to actually perfuse the brain. Um, so you have more fluid, basically, in my mind up in there. So you have more of a cushion, um, more of an airbag in there. And it, it, literally their stats are, are showing some, some incredible. So I, I think you guys are tapping on some amazing, um, data, um, that we can probably even sidestep into different arenas. And, and, uh, um, it's cool that you're on the forefront of treating that as well. <laughs> Absolutely incredible, incredible. Um, so walk me through, we got to talk about Ibu cause that's, that's exciting. Um, there are clinics like myself that haven't jumped into it. We're, we're trying to maximize, you know, uh, oxygen, ozone in the blood with major autohemotherapy and things like that. But, um, you know, we get a little bit of it and there's been, you know, ma machines and technology to be able to, to, um, up that quite a bit. So walk me through yeah. that, that com component of what you're doing. Yeah. So Ibu isn't anything new. It's just refined itself, uh, Dr. Bochi, which if you ever read his book, he's kind of the godfather of ozone from a biochemistry yeah. standpoint, right? Yeah. Um, he first started experimenting with it uh, back in the 1990s, and he was using it for perfusion injuries and terminal cancer patients. Those were kind of the mainstay that he started doing it for. And if you look at the old picture of the paper of it that he published, it was this massive machine and he had this guy called Nicola, who was a nephrologist, also helping him out. And so it's evolved and different machines have been built over time. I think probably two things took it off worldwide is one is we had COVID and a lot of people were looking for answers for oxygenation therapies. And two, we had people with chronic Lyme issues. And so all of a sudden this machine has taken off because of those two things. Yeah. And different varieties have come out of machines and they all have some similarity to it of basically what you're doing is you're moving blood out of one arm. You're putting it through a filter, which is only one component of renal dialysis. So it's, it's not dialysis, it's not apheresis, but it's one specific filter. Uh, that filter is known to pull out something called beta-2 microglobulin, which is a very inflammatory chemical in the body. So just alone running blood through that, you're going to have some improvement. Um, there's different types of filters out there, and certain companies have, have gone the length of like testing for them to make sure they're ozone resistant, make sure they're not producing you know microplastics into the pa patients. And so there's several different kind of apparatuses going on or different machines. And for me, I, I spent probably the last three or four years kind of going through them and seeing which one makes the most sense from a safety standpoint, which one makes the most sense from a, a perspective of also how does it look and operate? Because I'm a safety guy, but I also want to make sure my other practitioners or nurses, it's easy for them to use. A difficult machine makes it difficult for everybody in the clinic. So I went through different ones, looking at them, analyzing them, also looking at 
you know, what kind of data do we have? And there is some good data coming out. Some of them were sent to a lab that was called Fry Labs, their big infectious disease thing. And we, we presented some data at AAOT this year about the blood clots and biofilms that were found in there. And you actually would find, like you said, bacteria and viruses and low levels in that. And even Schallenberger brought up, hey, there's this paper, which I'm sure you just were talking about with Jason, that a lot of those biofilms and blood clots, of course, they contain microorganisms. Well, those microorganisms are releasing something called endotoxins. They're yes. just inflaming the system and toxifying the system. So one of the things we're noticing with Ibu is just plain giving them oxygen, not even adding ozone yet. Just turn the oxygen tank on, filter their blood through there, has a tremendous benefit. Um, and I've seen that in my patients where they're so fragile. It's like, let's just run oxygen, just filter them. And their limbic system and their, their cognition will literally turn on in the chair or after the session. Wow. And you'll see 40 to 60% change immediately with that, which we've done IV nutrition, we've done basic major auto hemotherapy, but to see that dramatic of a change is, is pretty amazing when you see that. The, the other component that you can use is ozone. And I think one of the things that here's where I'll, I'll kind of divert myself that's different from some of the other teachings. There's a lot of us teaching that high dose ozone is the answer and i would say it is not the most of the time if we start a person on high dose ozone we're exceeding physiologic limits and so what ends up happening to people is we get this definition of oh they had herxheimer reactions or they felt crappy yes to me what that means is you exceeded the ability of of the lymphatic or the extracellular orbs something called hormesis. How did your body handle that oxidative stress? Yes. And, and that was actually dangerous to do that in my perspective. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. You could eventually get up there, but think of it this way. Your physiology and your, your homeostatic mechanisms are like when you work out at the gym. If you're to, you haven't worked out two years, all of a sudden you hit the gym for two hours. How are you going to feel? You're going to feel awful after that. Yes. So if you hit a person with high amounts of ozone right away, it's the same thing. That system hasn't been conditioned and warmed up well enough. So most of the time I step people into those things. I, if they're really sick, I'll, I'll, I'll just give them oxygen and filtration just to get the body burden off, just to get oxygen in their tissues. And then we'll go up a little higher. And if you look at Bochi's work, they did test from a concentration that was one up to 80 micrograms per mil. Um, also gamma is another terminology that's used. And ultimately what they settled on was four. They said that was the safest and most effective dose was four gamma or four micrograms per mil. Wow. And that's huge. If you start to go above that seven, eight, you actually see there's a point where the blood can't take anymore. There's a saturation point. So it's, it's literally like more is not better. Your body's just letting it go by. Um, and you're seeing it not be absorbed. The, the other problem with doing too high of a dose is you have injury to cells. Cells can't handle that oxidative stress. So you see lysis. And I've unfortunately seen this where some people with Ibu are holding up this waste container. And you see this, oh, oh, look at all this toxic material in this waste container. And it's yellow and frothy and red. That's hemolysis. You actually caused damage. You over-treated the person. You overdid their physiologic limits. And, and that's my passion is like, okay, why did that happen? Was that a good thing or was that a bad thing? And I think most of us get excited and say, oh, something changed. But we don't understand that. Yes. And, until like the last couple of years, now we truly understand because we're analyzing that data and seeing a lot of these people that are getting sick after treatments because they've been over-treated. They've been treated too rapidly. We haven't conditioned the body before we go up to those higher dosages. And so Ibu, we want to keep the setting low. And most of the time, it's just literally moving that blood, getting oxygen, just giving them a tiny bit of ozone because 
ozone helps balance the body. It, it yeah. establishes homeostasis. It, it's not a direct kill mechanism. It's just improving the outcomes, conditioning the body for stressors or microorganisms. Love it. I'm glad you address that because I, you know, one of my problems um, in the past has um, is wrapping my brain around the concept of like oxygen. So I remember my my biochemistry, which was the same as everybody else's, like oxygen becomes a free radical at certain points, and those free radicals. Um, and again, I think Blaylock talked about free radicals. Um, he used the example of like a hot hot poker through a Kleenex. And that's literally what they can do to cells if they're not not uh, paired well, or you know, there's an excess of them there too. So um, that's phenomenal data and needs to be needs to be um, you know uh, looked at for sure. Um, especially somebody like myself that's that's treating those things. It's not always just more is better, <laughs> you know, to get up to the majors, you know, to start with minors and 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 walk through that um, that uh, journey with people that. I'm going to ask you, and this is kind of a, it's kind of a tougher question, but, um, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely some trends in it. I've said this from the, from the get go of like the general public is driving a lot of this now, which is, which is really good. You got influencers and, um, you know, people that are, um, uh, and not to pick on them at all because they're researchers like Ben Greenfield and, um, Dave Asprey and, um, they're all over and bringing the, this data in and people are consuming that data and, and then jumping in, whether it's supplements, whether it's, you know, bulletproof coffees and, you know, I mean, you just see these trends, people are wanting to jump into this type of stuff, but well, uh, you and I understand the aspects of, and you mentioned it earlier, the costs of things and the clinical application of a lot of these things and walking people down this journey that they think they want, you know, they see, um, and Ben's a stud, you can see him just shredded and this is what he does on a daily basis. So people are like, Hey, I'm just going to do all of that. Um, walk me through like a patient journey in, yeah. in your, in your world, like obviously the objective measures to kind of figure out what's going on. And then, um, you know, your key, you got to come back down to cost, but key factors that like, look, if you can get this or we can apply these things, I mean, how are you navigating that? And then, and this would be good for doctors that are going into this because the real world is not everybody has $20,000 to jump in on a package and make themselves feel well, even though I tell patients all the time, I'm like, just give me 20 grand and we'll be able to walk you down this journey and get your body back up to speed. And people are like, ah, you know. So there are some thresholds, but walk me through that. Because most of the what you guys are doing is outside insurance, um, you know, it, yeah. it, it, and, and it's just, you know, it's a different world. So shoot, tell me about that. So, I mean, one of the, in medicine, I think we have two ways of approaching. We have active, which is yeah. basically reactive medicine. That's what 85% of our patient clientele that comes to us. Hey, I got cancer. I got Lyme. I got this boo-boo. Fix me. I'm sick. And then we have the other group of 15 that are actually fairly healthy. They're looking to improve their health. I call them proactive, right? These are people that we want to keep building so we can keep running until we're 70, 80 and not being crippled by health problems. When I have a patient come in, uh, one of the things is to figure out where they are. Most of the time, again, they're reactive. And then the way analogy I use, and I think you use something similar in your practice, uh, I use the river of health model for reactive. So Everybody comes in, what's the bottom of a river look like? It's mucky, it's dirty, it's filthy, right? What's the top of the river look like? It's clean, it's pure, it's crisp. Where are you on the river? Most people tell me that they're on that bottom part of the river, hanging onto that rock. <laughs> and so the analogy I use is, first of all, there's a lot of cool tools out there, but we got to figure out specifically what tools work for you to stabilize you so you don't keep going down the river. And then we want to move you up the river. And one of the things that I see if I don't do this is people are so, I think, you know, social media and all these big influencers are great and showing products. But what happens is we don't, they come in and they think this one tool is going to fix everything. Yes. And it may get them up the river a little bit. And what ends up happening halfway up the river, everybody's symptoms goes away. But here's the issue that really happens. Usually four, five, six visits. Oh, yeah, I feel great, doc. You and I always see this six months to a year later, they're back in your office. They drifted back down the river. Why is that? 
because we did not address the core reason of why you drifted down the river in the first place. And I think that component is being missed in the social media presence. I think there's a lot of data on tools that can be used. And I think the, the general public gets kind of stuck on, yeah, this is the next best thing. It's going to fix everything. Yeah. And most of us know that never is the case. Um, the analogy I use is your contractor is not going to come into your home and sell you a hammer and say that's going to fix everything. They're going to sure. show you pictures of the beautiful remodel, and then they're going to have multiple tools and strategies to customize and personalize your specific needs for that remodel. Same thing happens in your health. Your, diff your condition is different than this person's condition. So this tool over here that works for most people may not work for you at all because you have to do these other things first for it to work. And I think so that's huge. huge in our clinical practice with, I have people coming in, I want Eboo. I heard it was the best thing ever. I want biologic allograph, AKA stem cells. I heard that will fix everything. Yep. And it's conveying to them, you're not ready for that, or that's not the appropriate tool where you are for them. And some will understand that and they want to work with you as a coach, mentor to move up the river. Others. It's like, okay, you really want this? Let's have you do it a couple times. If it fails, then we are going to do it with my way. We're going to work together and work your way up. I don't see one disease process that can be addressed with one single tool. It's yep. such a multiple dynamic precision medicine that is needed for people to get well. I love that. <clears throat> no, that's, if that's I, a huge, yeah, that's a huge point. I, um, I'm just kind of compound and I'm coming off of uh, talking with uh, uh, Dr. Schellenberger last Friday and uh, he was talking about bioenergy testing and, and that threshold of where oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, mesh. And he had this guy that was scheduled and uh, um, came in and his bio oxygen, um, our bioenergy testing was like, he's like, you're good. He's like, why are you here? And he goes, well, I wasn't good. And he's like, yeah, I saw your history. He's like, but on the way up, I stopped in and then uh, had these NAD treatments in a certain city on the California coast before he came over. <laughs> and, and so we were talking about like how NAD can be just a massive fix, um, but not for everybody. And um, how the utilization yeah. of NAD can actually, and I asked uh, Dr. Schallenberger, I said, well, what happens if we over-treat somebody with NAD you know, that necessarily doesn't yeah. need it. And he goes, I, I don't know. I've never done it. <laughs> and I go, well, that's brilliant. Right. But he, we were talking about one specific case that, uh, um, you know, he was so oxygen deprived um, that this fixed a lot of the solutions, but then there was a lot of work still yet to be done. Um, and so for practitioners, that's a huge point that, um, you know, and I do the same thing. I get involved in, in something. I get excited about, okay, here's the new tool. Here's the new thing. Let's say, um, and as you mentioned about supplements have been people's new medicine, if you will. And, um, I keep coming back for, for, um, the, the basis of, of what I try to teach people as well is like, look, what is supplement define the word? It's got to supplement mm -hmm. something. I mean, this is, you can't turn this into right. your new medicine. And we get that a lot. Hey, doc, do you got a supplement to help me with sleep? I'm like, okay, there's a, there's a huge, that's a big question. Or, or hey, doc, I, I, I want to improve my energy. Do you have something on the shelf that's going to do that? I go, well, you know, yeah. um, go get into, a, you know, a monster energy drink or something because that solves the basic <laughs> feeling of energy, but it doesn't, doesn't fix the problem. But uh, doc, I want to go into, if you don't mind, where do you see some new trends or, um, you know, uh, I, I, I just feel, um, everything is so rapidly advancing as far as technology and being able to, um, uh, to get data on these things quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I got some, you know, ideas with AI, but how AI is going to tell us how to do things and analyze, um, patients here for us yeah. pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> We've had some great talks with our medical doctor on team and, uh, our new team and stuff too. I'm like, man, pretty soon we don't have to, to think about this stuff anymore, but where do you see some new trends? Um, um, some things that you're excited about going over the next say five years, which is exponentially faster than it was the previous 10 or 15 or 20 years. I mean, one of the things I hope back to AI, 
I don't think it's going to replace a good integrative functional dock at all. I don't think their jobs or their use is going to be compromised at all because we're pretty much doing this already in conventional medicine with AI, right? Here's a platform, yes. here's a recipe, follow this and give you X. Yes. You could do that with a supplement. Like you said, it's not going to fix the person. So I think the trend is going to be, there's going to be a group that's going to go all AI, all protocol, and it will work for maybe 30 to 50% of people for symptomatic relief, palliative care, I call it. But yeah. I think you're going to have your pioneers who are critical thinkers who understand this multiple dimensional approach that are still going to exist. And my hope is that those people understand, I call a treatment formula. I have this many, these are my skills. These are the tools for evaluating and treating, and these are the results. And how do I continue to improve my results? Um, my hope is that full integrative therapy will come to minds of our top docs. And we'll, we'll have some pioneers that continue that message of critical thinking. I think the biggest art that's being lost in chiropractic school, naturopathic school, medical school, because, you know, your liability if you touch your patient is what I've heard from one medical school, conventional yes. medical school. Yep. I think the art of understanding and diagnosing the correct reason why your patient is ill in the first place is going to be massive going forward to make sure how do we properly diagnose a person with improper physiology to then be able to select the appropriate tools to get the results that we're looking for. As the age of what where we're at is outcome-based medicine. It's a very exciting time. I mean, people come to us because they're not getting results somewhere else. Yes. But people also are smarter now where they're, they don't want to just say, yeah, I just feel, I feel better. Great. Because everybody else out there, social media, their partners say, no, you're, it's placebo effect. You just like going and talking to that person. It's going to be on showing them that they're improving, using that live blood analysis, using labs, using different evaluation technologies to show them here you were, here you are now. Yes. Um, example of that. So there's a, there's a new one. And this is where AI is helpful. And I'm doing actually a study now with using chelation therapy and EBU for coronary, uh, coronary vascular health. Yes. There's a publication called TAC1. And TAC2 is going to be published next year that shows chelation is beneficial for cardiovascular health. I find and I believe EBU paired with that will step up the game even more. We have a tool that can evaluate that. It's called a coronary angiogram CT, where they oh, wow. basically will perfuse your heart and you get to look at the, the, the plumbing of your heart, right? But here's where AI plays into that. AI actually will read the image and do a 3D platform and give you more accuracy than the actual radiologist will. And will tell you, okay, it's 30% reduced here or it's this. And I think that's fascinating because now we can get data before they're heading towards, oh, you need a stent. And then I can intervene with tools like chelation or EBU and other things. And then I can redo that and say, Look at this change. Look at this improvement that we've seen. So we have, I think that's that's the beauty of where we're going. Medicine is AI and a lot of these new technologies of evaluation are really going to help us gear in our tool set for improving precision medicine of what we use for each condition more specifically. I love it. Um, and I'd say... To go back to that point, even with Dr. Schallenberger, I actually saw one of his patient, old patients recently, and they tested phenomenally on that oxygen delivery system, but I did my full workup. And it's like they have a high cal coronary calcium score. They got plaque in their, in their vessels and their carotids. There were certain tools that you need to do a little bit further to fully evaluate the patient. I think that's cool as we understand all the different possibilities so then we can again, target in on specific things. Um, I think these bi it. these biohackers, the great thing they're doing is they're bringing more attention to the field. I agree. On the yeah. downside is, like you said, people just want this one thing like NAD. 
And here's what I've seen with NAD. I've seen exactly what you talked about. What happens if you get too much NAD? Well, the person who gave the large dose NAD and then they wonder why the patient is depressed and suicidal. And I've seen this. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. NAD is niacin. Niacin blocks methylation. Guess why they're depressed and they're suicidal? You just blocked their methylation and they happen to have a predisposition for poor methylation. So that's just one of those keys of understanding, like I said, the full picture versus just a, a tool driven practitioner where they, oh, this is the new trend. Let's just hit them with this. Oh, this is the yes. new trend. Let's hit them with that. That doesn't work very well, I think, for, a, for improving overall health. I think it's more of a fad based thing. So, no, I agree. And there are tools to test these things and um, uh, to be able to identify before treatment. And uh, I agree with you, the excitement on that. Would you, I, I know we're coming down to about an hour. I wanted to keep you at that. I appreciate you, um, you know, sharing your, your wealth of knowledge here. But yeah. w will you go through chelation a little bit and, and, and the mechanism, um, uh, you know, because it's been around. God, for quite some time, phosphatidylcholine, uh, uh, known as, uh, you know, uh, generations of like plaque X and things like that. These tools have been out there. Chelation um, was talked about in a, um, in a, it was a Netflix series, I think, or a Netflix documentary at one time called Unleaded, but that disappeared <laughs> because um, we had all these cartoons cardio uh, thoracic surgeons were talking about don't go get surgery just chelate 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 um and and, and yeah, i don't yeah. think a lot of people know about the heart um and and, and you know the the vessel benefits of, of chel chelation therapy walk walk us through that so chelation therapy you know originally if you talk to any toxicologist they'll say it's only supposed to be used in somebody who's clinically toxic with lead, mercury. And if you look at what clinically toxic is, they're literally in the hospital about ready to die. That's <sighs> the clinical indication of it. Sure. Which for, for us, that's not a good scenario to wait until you're dying, right? So what we use it in our clinical practices for is if a person's heavy metal burden is increasing. And we see that a lot. I mean, it's in the environment, right? Mm -hmm. And those metals, what they do is they block things like nitric oxide which allows your blood vessels to dilate, allows men to get an erection and ozone increases nitric oxide. And then also removing those metals improves your nitric oxide. So what ended up happening is we used it for one way was let's get the metals out. The other way was a group of people that were saying, Hey, this is really great for cardiovascular health because of nitric oxide and removing the burden. The problem was, is there's this group that was basically, you know, regulators saying, hey, you can't use chelation for cardiovascular. There's no research out there. So a couple years back, uh, a group basically funded by NIH, which is the National Institute of Health, said, okay, we're going to do a trial of about 900 people and we're going to disprove chelation has any medical benefit for cardiovascular disease, period. They did it. And what they found is actually it did have improvement. And these are really bad people. These are people smoking, you know, diabetics, not making any lifestyle changes, no other intervention. And they did find benefit. So that led to what's called TAC2, which is the second trial, which is 25,000. It's much larger. Wow. And it's saying, okay, now that we've tested safety, we did find clinical efficacy. Now let's do that again in a bigger scale. And from what I know, there's one group out um, in Eastern Idaho a big clinic does clinical research and there's a group at university of california irvine that was doing it that i know those people they said the data we're seeing in our individual groups for tac2 is very impressive we're seeing wow. people that are like just can't walk more than a couple steps or people that are having that ash gray look who are getting their color back and moving just with chelation therapy so with Love that it. data, you're going to see the paper come out next year. And I, 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 I am looking forward to it because I believe we're going to see very good data on that as a tool for cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's huge. And the number one, uh, as they call them, horseman that was um, um, out, out there uh, as far as uh, cause of, of, of death for, for decades in the last 
yeah. many, many, many decades. Um, that's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. All right, Doc, yeah. we're about at an hour. I so appreciate it. It's an honor to sit with you and uh, get a chance to interview you. I appreciate you jumping on. Um, will you just um, tell people where um, where your clinic is, if they want to reach out to you um, and uh, um, uh, not only learn from you, but uh, um, subject themselves to your your processes and things like that? Yeah. So my clinic's Interactive Health Clinic. I'm north of Seattle. Um, I also do some work with, like I said, the Neuroscience Center in Chicago, uh, a clinic in Northern California for my clinical applications. I still do actively see patients. Um, the other area of my, my expertise is, like I said, I love te teaching, I have a passion for it, drbrendancochran.com, where I have classes for practitioners to learn about IVs, ozone, EBU, um, and they can kind of see where I've been and what I'm up to as well. Oh, phenomenal resource. Uh, all right. I know you're a busy man and I'll let you get about your day and, um, I'm sure we'll, we'll be connecting soon. All right. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Me. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and, uh, take care. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.